I'm Richard Rhodes. Uh, I've written four volumes, a quartet of books on the nuclear age, starting with the discovery of the electron in 1898 and following forward from there to basically the present. I looked at the development of the first nuclear weapons during the Second World War and then followed the years of the Cold War down to and including the U.S. wars with Iraq and uh, even the more recent concerns about Iran and other countries. So this is a subject that I have devoted more than 30 years of my life to researching and writing about. In addition, more recently, uh, kind of fortuitously, because I was working with the documents from the Reykjavik summit between Mikhail Gorbachev and Ronald Reagan, I wrote a play which has been getting readings around the country. Substantively, it was the beginning of the end of the Cold War. Not only did the two leaders uh, take each other's measure and realize that they could work together, but most importantly, it was the beginning of the first time the two nations agreed to begin reducing nuclear nuclear arsenals. Prior to that, in all the Cold War years, the negotiations had always been about basically keeping each other more or less equal in weapons, going up at a slower rate than we might have gone up in terms of numbers, but never the idea of actually cutting back. So it was a very important event, but you know, writers write about things that you can write about, and that's usually determined by the documentation. And I was just dazzled by the richness of debate that went on between these two world leaders, uh, their characters, their very different characters, and saw that the transcripts from that summit could very easily be turned into a very powerful drama. So I wrote the play to, to, I had to learn how to write plays, but once I'd done that, I wrote the play to try to bring back to life for all of us something that happened secretly behind closed doors at the time. I was fortunate enough to get my hands on both the American and the Russian transcripts. And I had the Russian transcripts translated. The Russian transcripts were basically court stenography. They were verbatim transcripts of what the people said. I think that the transcriber didn't want to get into any trouble by making selections from, from President Gorbachev's words. The American transcripts, more typically of meetings like this, were basically notes by uh, an observer, a, a secretary, uh, that, that summarized what the two people said. Nevertheless, I was really struck by the fact that the American transcript, which was supposed to be a, a primary historical document, was systematically expunged of any reference on President Reagan's part to the idea of eliminating nuclear weapons. President Reagan's aides had always thought this preoccupation of his with, with nuclear abolition was, was silly. I mean, really, they did think that. They were, they were pretty condescending to this man about his, his longstanding belief that nuclear weapons should be abolished. So they just simply edited it out of their transcripts. But fortunately, because I had the, the Soviet transcript, I was able to see what really was said between the two men. First and foremost, serious discussion that was out on the table after Reykjavik of reducing and even potentially eliminating strategic nuclear arms. Um, an agreement that wasn't con confirmed at Reykjavik because Gorbachev was offering a package, all or nothing. Nevertheless, both sides agreed to eliminate intermediate range nuclear missiles from Europe which took away a terrible threat to the Soviet Union because the delivery time for a missile fired from West Germany toward Moscow would have been under 10 minutes, which means no time to, to react at all. 
uh, that was a threat and a burden that, that was one of the primary reasons Gorbachev was negotiating above and beyond the larger discussion. Uh, and that followed. They, that, that, they went ahead with that. Ironically, it was the, the nefarious Richard Pearl's idea in the first place, zero, zero, as it was called, zero American, zero Soviet nuclear weapons in Europe, because he was sure the Soviets would never agree to it. And he thought it would be a great place to ruin an arms control discussion. Then when, in fact, they did agree to it, uh, he walked around bragging proudly that it was his deal, that he'd put it together. <laughs> so that was Richard Pearl. Maybe we should write a play about Richard Pearl, <laughs> give him some horns. <laughs> but after that, I think all the issues on the table began to be open for negotiation. Gorbachev didn't go home and say, oh, well, no, no, never mind. We'll continue to spend a third of our federal budget on, on, on the arms race. He continued to make unilateral moves. So did we. The most dramatic changes, of course, came after the collapse of the Soviet Union, when George H.W. Bush, uh, bless his heart, decided that if we didn't need all these nuclear weapons, we'd cut our arsenals on our own. And we did an enormous reduction in nuclear weapons all over the world. That was dramatic. But there were other agreements that followed from Reykjavik, uh, such as, and some of my advisors whom I've interviewed make this their idea of the most important thing that happened in the Cold War, an agreement between Soviet forces and NATO forces that they would have equal numbers of tanks and planes and so forth. The Soviets had had three or four times as many tanks uh, poised to attack in, Ger in East Germany as had NATO. And that was, from NATO's point of view, a great threat. It turned out after the war was over and the documents uh, saw the light of day that the reason the Soviets had so many tanks in West Germany is that they didn't think they could repair them fast enough if they broke down in battle from the very superior anti-tank weapons that NATO had. So they wanted to have them on hand, some reserves on hand. It wasn't because they wanted some advantage. They were afraid they didn't have an advantage, be that as it may. Once the two sides, NATO and, and the equivalent Soviet forces in Germany, agreed to equal levels, Europe was safe because NATO understood it had vastly superior equipment. I mean, you can count tanks, but then the question is, how good is the tank you're counting? And NATO's forces were, were technologically better machines and so forth. So one friend of mine who's an arms negotiator counts that treaty as the, mark, the marker of the end of the Cold War. But all of this fell loose once the, the, the stitching in, in the Cold War was opened at Reykjavik. The cornucopia opened and all sorts of things followed, including, of course, the opening of Eastern Europe and Eastern Germany and things that perhaps Gorbachev would have liked to see happen more slowly and carefully, but he really didn't have control at that point. I have really mixed feelings about where we are today. By we, I mean the world. Uh, we still have eight nuclear powers, uh, eight or nine, <clears throat> two real superpowers. The United States and, the Soviet, and, and Russia now have reduced their arsenals dramatically, but they haven't reduced them nearly enough to, if they were used, prevent world-scale climatic effects, nuclear winter, and its lesser level but equally destructive uh, climate changes that, are, that even a small nuclear exchange, it turns out, would produce dramatic changes in the weather of the world. Uh, the scientists who studied the atmosphere back in the 1980s and realized that a full-scale nuclear exchange would lead to a condition they called nuclear winter, where the average mean and the mean annual temperature of the world would drop by 20 degrees or more, basically freezing up the world and we'd all die of starvation because agriculture would fail. 
were interested in taking another look at their model using the much more sophisticated computer models of the atmosphere that had been developed in the interim exactly because global warming had become a question, a scientific question. And when they did, they discovered, first of all, that a full-scale nuclear exchange, which of course was no longer likely because the Soviet Union had dissolved and Russia was, was not our enemy, if not quite our ally, um, they were, the effects would still, would actually have been worse had there been a full-scale war than, than their earlier model had predicted. But then they were curious what would happen if you had a little regional nuclear war. So they, they, they said, what if India attacked Pakistan with 50 Hiroshima-sized 15 kiloton nuclear weapons? And what if Pakistan did the same to India? Uh, inevitably, those weapons would be exploded over cities. They would start what are called mass fires, huge tornadoes of fire. And to the scientists' horror, 15, uh, 100 small nuclear weapons, the equivalent of 1.5 megatons, and we have individual nuclear weapons that have yields higher than 1.5 megatons. But because they would start fires in cities, that small regional nuclear war would drop world mean average temperatures by two or three degrees, which doesn't sound like a lot. I had some baffling engineer say, oh, that would take care of global warming, wouldn't it? But the truth is it would result, they estimated, in 20 million prompt deaths from fire in the cities, but another two billion deaths from starvation, from the, the shriveling of, of of agriculture because of the reduction in temperature during the summer. So we're not out of the woods by any stretch of the imagination. If only 100 small nuclear weapons can produce world-scale climatic effects, then however benevolent we feel about our nuclear arsenal, however benevolent Russia is about its nuclear arsenal, they are still an existential threat to the world. So that's one side of the story. And I don't see either country immediately or continuing reductions. I think President Obama probably will make some proposals or is making some proposals. Uh, and I don't know whether the Soviet side will go along. But there's a fundamental axiom about nuclear weapons that was first articulated at the Canberra Commission meetings in 1996, a, a meeting of international leaders to discuss how would you get to nuclear abolition. And it says, with the force almost of a physical axiom, as long as any country has nuclear weapons, others will seek to acquire them. That's the world we still live in, and it's still a profoundly dangerous world. On the other hand, we have made powerful moves I think the most hopeful isn't the obvious reduction in the number of nuclear weapons, but something that's been going along quietly in the background. As we have approached the coming into force of the Comprehensive Nuclear Test Ban Treaty, that organization has systematically been developing worldwide monitoring systems in the water, in the air, uh, seismic and other to keep track of any possible nuclear test anywhere in the world. A system so sensitive that it can track 50 pounds of D TNT exploding under the ocean from half a world away. That system will be in place, is already largely in place. And it's another way that, that the world is moving away from dependence on nuclear weapons for supposedly protecting their countries and moving toward a world where nuclear weapons themselves are perceived to be the problem, not Russian nuclear weapons or American nuclear weapons or even Iranian nuclear weapons, if ever there are such. But the weapons themselves are the danger. And I think if we can understand that, we will be able to move to the place where we're all still protected by the knowledge of how to make them. I mean, a world without nuclear weapons would not be a nuclear-free world. It would be a world where delivery time had been moved back from 30 minutes to three months.
six months, a year, the time it would take to reconstitute the, the materials and the factories and the machinery to make some more nuclear weapons. And in that period of time, there would be more time to negotiate. There would be more time, if necessary, for conventional uh, intercession. And we would not be so much at risk to, to a false signal in a computer somewhere. I do. I do think we'll get there. Well, when Halpern says that, he then says, because we know how to make them. And the world I'm describing wouldn't lose that knowledge. In fact, it would be carefully maintained. But it would be maintained at the level of mothballed factories, if you will, rather than of finished weapons on alert in silos all over the world. It would be a deliberate delaying of delivery time to allow more time for alternatives to, to be put in place. This is the vision that uh, really inspired Robert Oppenheimer, the scientist who led the building of the first atomic bombs at Los Alamos in New Mexico and who was a key figure after the Second World War in what came to be called the Baruch Plan. The question there was, how do you internationalize this and what do you do about cheaters? Always the question. And Oppenheimer said to a skeptic, well, he, the skeptic said, well, what if some countries started reconstituting their nuclear arsenal? And Oppenheimer said, well, that would be an act of war, wouldn't it? And all the other countries in the world would presumably respond to that act of war conventionally, or at worst, and this I think is the, the extreme case of what I'm describing, if in the worst case some country began to rebuild their nuclear arsenal, then the other countries that had maintained the knowledge could begin to do so as well. At the end of that chain, we would only be where we are now with nuclear weapons in various places on alert. So we know what the end point would be of such a world. What we need to do is now slowly move things. And I understand that President Obama, certainly he's been presented with this idea, is interested in taking our nuclear weapons off this 30 minute alert time. It's dangerous, it's way too dangerous. So we'll start doing that, I suspect. But it has to be embodied finally in treaties and in laws, in international agreements so that everyone knows everyone's on the same page and knows what's going on. And it has to be embodied in a world scale, which as I said, is being constructed. A world scale system for keeping track uh, of any activity with nuclear materials anywhere. I can speak about leadership, at least to the American side. Nuclear weapons got tangled up in domestic American politics a long time ago. One of the reasons so little happened between the end of the Cold War and today, discounting George H.W. Bush's marvelous reductions that he made in the US arsenal, is because it's been much too easy for Republican candidates in the United States to accuse Democratic candidates for the presidency to, uh, of being weak on defense. And it's a powerful challenge. Americans worry about their security like everyone else. That alone, I think, was sufficient to prevent much progress on these nuclear issues. And notably, President Obama set this issue aside during his presidential campaign. Um, there are rumors that once the election is over and everything is settled, that, that he might make some important unilateral changes. And I think at this point, that's going to be the way things have to proceed. Uh, we've had a lockup in the US Congress, which has to ratify any treaties. The CTBT has been hanging fire now since 1999. I think that's probably something President Obama wants to make happen as well. The, the final ratification of the CTBT. Um, it's just been very politically complicated in this country to, to do what should have been done a long time ago. It's really quite infuriating. 
I mean, our country knows what's appropriate. Uh, these, these, these petty politics have very little to do with the realities of nuclear weapons and nuclear arsenals and, and the international uh, relations. But unfortunately, they get in the way. In the short term, in terms of American government, American presidents begin to worry about their historical legacy in their second terms, typically. And we may just hope that President Obama will, will make the pledges he gave at the very outset of his presidency uh, in Prague and with the accepting of the Nobel Peace Prize, that he will follow through now and, and do some concrete changes which again seem to be in the offing, we'll see. In the longer range, I think ultimately nuclear weapons have to be understood to be dangerous in and of themselves, that they're not political instruments. They don't come with an American flag on the side or a Russian flag or an Iranian flag. They're, in my mind, analogous to disease in the sense that there was a time when people all over the world thought that diseases were something God visited upon populations who had sinned. Uh, it was the development of the science of bacteriology and the understanding that these were natural organisms, not some sort of divine retribution that slowly led, led the world to a position where through the efforts of the public health movement, most of all, we could begin to pull ourselves free from what was a terrible plague of what one theoretician calls biologic death. We haven't even begun to tackle man-made death. And man-made death is, the, is still construed as somehow tied up with whether one is an Iranian or a Russian or an American or whatever political complexion people have. No, these are existentially dangerous weapons. They're the issue, and it's a common issue across all boundaries. I was so struck by the program to eradicate smallpox, which started in the 1950s and culminated in the late 1970s with the last case of human smallpox on Earth. That, those those uh, public health workers crossed every national boundary. At the height of the Cold War, Russian public health workers came to the United States, vice versa. People were going in and out of countries uh, of total, that, that normally would not let anyone in. And they were welcomed because it was understood that disease has no politics. That somehow, and I can't do a perfect translation in how you do that with man-made death, because man-made death is an immensely more complicated question than biologic death. But, but, but to take that frame, I mean, I think of the public health institution in the world as corresponding to the, the developing CTBT institution of inspections and technology that watches out, uh, and even the physical inspections that are accomplished. These have a public health-like quality to them. And I think, in fact, whether we know it or not, that's the direction we're moving in. And in the longer run, I think that's going to be the direction that ultimately changes things. When we all understand that these are things you don't want, that they're dangerous, that they have to be dealt with by professionals who are trained to deal with them, that they don't aggrandize your country because you have more smallpox than the country next door, then I think we'll be there. It sounds, it sounds fantastical, but so did public health in the 19th century. As I learned in trying to write a play based on the transcripts of a diplomatic meeting, the emotions don't come through in the transcripts. They have to be somehow reassembled, and that's one of the wonderful things art does. Art also makes it possible to, to get behind the, the formal facade of, 
of behavior and look at motivation, look at reasons why people might act and think the way they do. All the, and, and ultimately the fact is art had its origins in attempts by human beings to communicate deeply to each other. I mean, those caves in Lascaux in France with those wonderful bison and other animals on them were certainly, among other things, uh, an effort to say, this is the animal we're going to be hunting tomorrow, and look how big and powerful he is. And you know, Picasso, when he looked at those images, said all the major problems of art were solved 30,000 years ago. So the function of art, among other things, is to give you the experience of, of these, these events. And to the extent that it's possible to do that, I think it allows people to engage them at a much deeper level than they would otherwise. About 20, 10 to 20,000 a year these days, which means it's being used as a college text, basically. But it's sold more than a million copies in about 12 different languages. And, and I know has had an effect because I've talked to many, many people in government and in the science community who say that book really opened my eyes. And I think it's important that it's a narrative. It's a novel-like, although factually correct. So you can, again, engage it as on a fellow human being level. Fortunately, the people I was writing about were 200 of the most literate human beings of the 20th century. So it was no great task to, to bring them back alive on those pages.